When you sit down to play a game of Magic the Gathering, you have a lot of information at your disposal. You know your own deck, what cards are in it, and how it hopes to win. You know what a good opening hand looks like and when it's time to mulligan. But you also have a lot of contextual information. You know the meta of your format, and if you've played against your opponent before, you might know exactly what they're likely to play. But what about everything you don't know? You see, every game of Magic is filled with hidden information, and knowing what you don't know can be the key to your success. Today we take another deep dive into the mechanics of the game, asking the questions, why is hidden information so powerful? Which mechanics throughout history have explored this idea, and how can you get a better handle on what your opponents are hiding from you? Almost every game ever made has some degree of hidden information. The famous exceptions are abstract games like chess, where both players are aware of everything about the board state at all times. But these games are the exception, not the rule. Game designers will use all the tools available to them when creating a game, and card games in particular are very well suited to keeping information secret. Indeed, games like poker are entirely predicated on the idea of not knowing what's in someone's hand. Magic status as a card game means that hidden information is inevitable. In an article entitled, What is Magic?, Reed Duke included it as one of the core elements of the game. Sam Stoddard, too, said that hidden information has done a lot for magic success. And Mark Rosewater considered it one of his 10 things every game needs, saying it makes it much harder to know what to do because it makes the decision tree infinitely more complex. What he means is that any actions you could take in a game of magic will lead to other actions you can take, which in turn lead to other actions, not to mention responses from your opponent. These actions might be playing specific cards or they might be deciding to use an activated ability, pay a certain cost, or block with a certain creature. You can think of these decisions as the branches of a tree, expanding outward with each possibility. To help illustrate this idea, let's look at some other games. Consider a game like Tic-Tac-Toe, which has no hidden information and only a few simple actions. You can, with some effort, picture the entirety of the decision tree, encompassing all possible game states. A vastly more complicated game like chess has a much, much larger decision tree. But because the game has no hidden information, you can still just about imagine what that tree might look like, especially if you do your best Elizabeth Harmon impression. Now imagine doing that in Magic the Gathering. Ruin crab, I concede. <clears throat> Anyway, it quickly becomes obvious that the sheer scale of possibilities involved is not only enormous, but actually unknowable. When you don't know what your opponent is playing or could have in their hand, solving the game state becomes an impossible feat. This is part of why teaching an AI to play magic is very difficult indeed. The game is designed to help with this too. In most formats, the first few turns aren't especially impactful, but they offer just the right glimpse of your opponent's plan. If your opponent plays turn one mountain, turn two island, the vast possibilities of what they could have in their hand become much smaller. On top of that, there are plenty of cards that help minimize the amount of hidden information. Glasses of Urza was the original artifact that let you see what your opponent had in store. But nowadays, these abilities are most often printed on black sorceries like Thoughtseize and Duress. You might notice that Wizards of the Coast rarely prints repeatable hand-viewing cards like Glasses of Urza or Telepathy because they realized fairly quickly that the game stopped being much fun if you always knew what your opponent had. Conversely, cards like Thoughtseize let you see what your opponent has in store, but allows them to once again have hidden information once they draw new cards. Of course, the hand is only one source of secrets. Magic has had several mechanics that dabble in this space, 
even outside of the hand. Morph is the first great success story of hidden information mechanics, printed way back in 2002. Certain cards had played around with face-down mechanics before, but this was the first set-wide implementation. A card with Morph can be played as a face-down creature for three generic mana. It's a colorless, nameless 2-2 with no abilities, so pretty weak. But you can turn it face up by paying the Morph cost on the other side, at which point it becomes whatever is printed on the front face. The cards originally printed with Morph weren't especially powerful. Of the Morph cards from Onslaught, Exalted Angel is worth the most money, but still isn't great. But the real power of the mechanic isn't on the front face. It's the obscuring of information that comes with playing it face down. A Morph card could be absolutely anything, and thanks to Future Sight, it might not even be a creature. However, it was in the cons of Tarkir block that the Morph mechanic reached new heights. Thanks to the prevalence of three color decks in that format, trying to identify a particular morph became an even harder task. In Limited, a player playing Sultai might be representing anything, from a simple Pine Walker to a more dangerous Grim Horus Spex, or the unusually costed Dragon's Eye Savants. Note that this last card also plays in the same space mentioned earlier, allowing you to look at your opponent's hand for the cost of revealing part of your own. Morph in Cons of Tarkir was all well and good, but the designers had something else up their sleeve for Fate Reforged. The follow-up set didn't include any cards with Morph, but instead introduced Manifest. Manifest isn't a keyword, but is instead a keyword action. That's a verb with a special game meaning. In this case, manifesting a card means putting it on the battlefield face down, as if it were a morph. But since, in many cases, you'll be manifesting the top card of your library without knowing what it is, it probably doesn't actually have morph. What makes Manifest special is this. As long as it's a creature, you can turn it face up for its mana cost. The beauty of this mechanic is that it takes the variables of Morph and expands them to include all possible cards in the format. There were 35 Morph cards in Cons of Tarkir, which is a lot, but it's certainly possible to memorize the most important ones and get a good guess at what your opponent is representing. With Manifest, that task becomes nearly impossible. You would need to consider every single creature in the format, as well as take into account the possibility that it isn't a creature at all. Manifest allows for deeper play and expands the decision tree by a lot. Mechanics like Morph and Manifest are popular, but as we've already seen, they create a lot of complexity for a set. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's possible that too much complexity can cause a set to become difficult to draft, particularly for new players. Nonetheless, after creating a face-down mechanic for creatures, then for non-creature permanents, it seemed only natural that the design team get to work on a morph variant for spells, too. Fortel was introduced in Kaldheim and was directly inspired by Morph. A spell with Fortel can be exiled face down for two generic mana and then cast for its alternate cost on a future turn. What's exciting about Fortel is that it can absolutely be anything with 36 possibilities in all five colors. Certainly some options are not so likely, but in a strange way that makes them even better choices. Your enemies will never see a dual strike coming. Haha. -ha. Another inspiration for Fortel was the Suspend mechanic, which would allow you to start casting a spell for a cheaper cost and wait a few turns to get it. The big difference is that by the time the spell hits the board, everybody at the table knows what it is. This contrast is a key example of why hidden information is such a powerful concept. We've seen now that hidden information can come from a whole variety of sources, but so far we've only talked about how you can use this to your advantage. What are you expected to do if your opponent is using them against to you? The answer will depend on your strategy. An aggressive deck is rarely interested in figuring out what their opponent knows. As long as they're not being disrupted too badly, they will keep turning creatures sideways regardless of the other side's mind games. On the other hand, a control deck will be more interested in figuring out the opponent's plan so that they can figure out the most efficient possible way to disrupt it. This can be as simple as using Gitaxian Probe to figure out the opponent's hand to decide where best to use your counter spell. In the same article by Reed Duke I mentioned earlier, he says that while gaining information can give you an important advantage, you don't need to be a mind reader to be a successful magic player. In my experience, which is to say in Reed's experience, it's rare for two magic players to engage in a deadly stare down in the wake of a game-changing bluff. 
I used poker as an example of a game where hidden information is absolutely everything. In Magic, it's more like the secret sauce. It might not decide every single game you play, but it remains too important to ignore. You can't be expected to know everything. Even the pros can't take every possibility into account. But if you want to make use of hidden information, my biggest tip is this. Figure out what information is important to you and what information is important to your opponent. You don't need to have the world's greatest poker face, but a sense of timing and prioritization will get you far. And I hope very much that this tour of the hidden depths of Magic the Gathering has been of some help to you. For further reading, consider taking a look at my Talarian Tutor series, which includes an entry on Thought Seas. Which of these mechanics would you like to see return? Have your bluffing skills won you some great games in the past? Let me know in the comments below. The main reason that functional errata like this is avoided is a desire to ensure physical cards reflect their mechanical function. After all, Tarmogoyf was never supposed to have one more toughness than power. That was a mistake added in development. It would be easy to change the official online card reference to the quote-unquote correct toughness, but then every existing copy of that card would be wrong. Imagine the confusion that might lead to. All right, I'm going to tap two and play a Tarmogoyf. Uh-huh, cool. So I have two card types in my graveyard and you have one. That makes it a 3-3. Three, three. <laughs> no, it's a 3-4. No, it's a 3-3. Three, three. It says plus one right there. Oh, that? They changed that. You're making that up. Now they change cards all the time. Anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and cast Shock for eight damage. I guess. 